Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Mike Anderson. My guest this week is Plots Coordinator, Private Lands Open to Sportsman Coordinator, Kevin Kading. Kevin, it's June. We're standing out here in front of a plot sign, nice green grass in the background. The Plots program produces a lot of wildlife habitat. Yeah, a lot of people associate plots with fall and fall hunting. That's probably when most people are out on plots and maybe the first time they've stepped foot on a plots tract is in the fall. And, and, and that's largely what they're used for, obviously, but um, we just kind of wanted to let people know, you know, that, or, you know, kind of make people aware that plots are producing wildlife all year long. This is the time of year when uh, a, lot of, a lot of habitat is producing, producing wildlife. Kevin, behind us, it's, it's a field full of nice grass from this year and some from last year. Why is that grass important? Any grassland component, we have a, you know, is important for grassland dependent birds, grassland nesting birds, um, you know, from, from ducks to, to pheasants to grouse to our state bird, the meadowlark, and everything in between. And they all take a little bit different requirements. They all maybe have a little different um, habitat needs, you know, different types of species, different height of the grass, different composition of the grass. But if you boil it all down, they all need grass. They're grassland dependent and we're a prairie state. And so um, that habitat this time of the year is, is vitally important for these birds to be able to pull off a, a successful brood. And so this, this piece that we're looking at right here that's in plots, um, it's a mixture of you know, some old growth from last year. So it's kind of got a little bit of that, you know, that structure in it, but then it's also got this year's new growth coming in there too. And, and so you know, we see these areas like this, but it's nice to have a mosaic of different habitat types out there too. So you might see some areas that get grazed. Some management has to be done. And so um, sometimes you might come out and there might be some shorter grass or it might not have as much residual cover from last year. Um, but that's that mosaic that you want. Kevin, what can private landowners do at this time of year to improve their habitat? So there's a lot of things that can be done to manage these grasslands and they do need some management. You know, they can't just be left idle for, for 10, 20 years. Um, there was a time when that was probably what we thought was the best thing to do, but um, having some um, some disturbance out there, some frequent management done on them uh, on these lands is, is beneficial long term. You know, whether that's haying, grazing, mowing, burning, you know, some form of disturbance. Even, even going out onto planted grasslands like CRP or, or, or a plots tract or something like that and, and disking it lightly to kind of rejuvenate that grass and, and get a forb response again, that's all beneficial. Um, sometimes it might look to uh, a hunter or to someone that's maybe not aware of what's happening out there that it's destroying habitat, um, but it's actually a longer term benefit. Just like if you come out and in the middle of May or April or something like that and there's a prescribed burn going on, you know, you might have a little loss of production or loss of habitat that one year, but it's for a longer term benefit overall. You're benefiting that grass stand overall. Okay, what can landowners do to, uh, to help the, the production of wildlife at this time of year? Well, if, um, if a landowner is wanting to have more uh, habitat, the first thing they gotta look at is if they have this, this nesting component, this, this quality nesting and fawning, I should say, not just for grassland birds, but white-tailed deer, or a lot of our deer are also dependent on these areas. But if you don't have the habitat component, um, you could look at planting some grass out there and um, if you do have that grass already out there, maybe look at some best management practices to manage the grass in a way that's gonna be more beneficial to the grassland birds. And there's some things that can be done with that too, uh, um, whether it's delaying the haying uh, in certain areas uh, or certain times of the year to maybe later summer. Some of these grassland birds will go all the way into August for nesting and, and brood rearing. So uh, the longer they can delay that, the better. I know that's not always possible for, you need your hay obviously, but uh, if you do, um, some haying out there, they can look at haying it in a rotation that um, doesn't trap birds in the middle. It, you know, hay from the center outward or hay towards habitat. You can kind of push the birds out of that area into the habitat that's left standing instead of trapping them in the middle when it's all done. And again, that depends on the equipment you're using and things like that, but it, um, it's not always as easy as it sounds, but it's, there's some things they can look at doing that, that way. Okay, you kind of mentioned a little bit bit ago about the metal arc nesting, but this also goes with the small sparrows and grassland birds too. They also need grass. Right, right. Yeah, any of the grassland birds are dependent on having this cover out there, whether it's planted cover, like through CRP, through plots, 
um, or native prairie, native range that's already out there existing. Um, and like I said before, they all have a little bit different niche that they fill and a little bit different habitat need or uh, composition of grass that they, that they like. Um, but, you know, for example, if you look at, you know, some, a bird that everyone's familiar with, a pheasant, you know, you take a look at a pheasant and they spend the bulk of their life uh, within a home range of a square mile. And so on that square mile of land you own, you want to make sure you have that nesting cover component out there. Generally 10 to 20 percent should be quality nesting cover. What else besides grass do these nesting birds need? Well, it's not just the grasslands. It's obviously those wetlands that are out embedded in these grasslands are, are very important. Um, but having these large blocks of grassland intact is, is key. Um, if you have if there's a way to connect some other blocks of grassland through some, you know, just you know, adding more grass in between those areas, that's also going to benefit those grassland birds. Um, there's also, you know, throughout, the, we're talking June right now, so this is nesting and uh, brood rearing time where, um, you know, we get to fall, you kind of start to get into a different type of habitat need. And you get to winter, you're going to need more thermal cover, winter cover, and maybe some food sources. Um, and so, depending on the time of year, you're going to need, you know, escape cover, brood cover, nesting cover, or fawning cover. Um, all of these things are um, key for, you know, getting wildlife throughout through the year. Um, a lot of times, I think, the public or um, in general, we focus on winter habitat. Um, that's when we see wildlife probably at their most stressed time of year. Um, but if you take, again, a lot of grassland birds and pheasants or resident wildlife, if they'll get through that period of time. And even if they don't, if the general, you know, if the overall population can get through that, if you've got the nesting cover out there the following year, they can rebound very quickly. I mean, that's why it's important to have this out on the landscape. This is the time of year when all the production is going on, and this is what drives the population. Okay, what is the key time period? Anywhere from as early as middle of April to as late as August, you know, these birds are on the nest or, or, or raising that brood out there. So it's not only the nesting part of it, but it's also that brood rearing part of it where these are just little chicks, you know, they're just little guys that are trying to get around out there. And so um, they, need, they need some good open ground underneath that, underneath that cover. They need uh, some insects out there to feed on. That's their main protein or main diet for that first, you know, first part of their life. And so having those components out there is really, really benefit. A lot of great information, Kevin. Now we're gonna bring Dr. Bill Jensen, big game biologist in, and he's gonna talk more about white-tailed deer and how grasses are so important when they're fawning. Joining me now is big game biologist, Bill Jensen. Bill, why is that good quality habitat important for white-tailed deer at this time of year? Well, this time of the year, the home range of uh, white-tailed doe is about a mile and a half. But for her fawn, that fawn is confined to about 100 acres or less. So everything that that fawn needs to survive has to be within that 100 acres. And th that's highly dependent on good quality hiding habitat. Bill, what is good quality habitat for white-tailed deer at this time of year? Well, this time of the year, they, they need a variety of different things. They need food, water, and shelter. Uh, for the doe, she's going to have to have uh, free water available because she's nursing so much and this is the most energetically demanding time of the year for her so she needs water and high quality food. For the fawn uh, it needs good hiding cover uh, so that it can hide from predators such as coyotes and that usually consists of uh, low vegetation cover at least 18 inches in height. They also like overstory vegetation that that shrubs and trees can provide, uh, and it all needs to be within that uh, 100 acres. Usually they want or need about 50 to 75 percent of that uh, home range in uh, stable bedding cover. So this is the time of year that carries our white-tailed deer population into the future, essentially? Y yes. The, the from the research that we've done, the peak of the fawning season in North Dakota and the Dakotas in general is uh, about June 6th. Within two weeks of June 6th, 75 percent of the fawns are born. And within four weeks of June 6th, 90 per, over 90 percent of the fawns are born. Okay, and if we don't have this good quality habitat, what happens? 
It, it subjects it to higher predation because if they're confined to narrow tree rows, those fawns and, for that matter, pheasants are easily found, uh, and their nests destroyed too. Uh, you know, you, they could be born in a, a plowed field too, but those fawns uh, usually die of hypothermia or are easily found by predators. Bill, are there any other key components for a white-tailed deer survival? Well, this time of the year when the doe is nursing, she has to have free water to drink at least once a day uh, within her home range. Uh, so small wetlands aren't just important for ducks, they're important for deer too. At this time of year too, Bill, when people are driving down the road, they may see a fawn in the ditch or they may come across a fawn if they're taking a hike. What should they do? Leave it alone, leave it where it is. Uh, the doe has evolved, specially developed milk that coagulates in the stomach of the fawn so it's digested slowly and she only needs to go back and nurse that fawn a couple times a day so although you might think that fawn's abandoned there's a doe nearby and she's probably watching you while you're looking at the fawn. A lot of great information Bill, thank you. Like Kevin and Bill just mentioned the critical nesting and brood rearing time starts about mid-April and can go all the way into August and the peak fawning time for white-tailed deer is around June 6. For Kevin Kading, big game biologist Bill Jansen, and the rest of the staff here at the Game and Fish Department, thanks for joining us for this week's Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.